classical theistic arguments for the existence of God take many forms, from medieval classicalists like Thomas Aquinas to contemporary classicalists like Edward Fazer, these arguments have been honed and refined over time. In this video, I want to focus on a Neoplatonic argument for God's existence put together by Edward Fesser in his book Five Proofs for the Existence of God. The argument, or at least my formulation of it, goes as follows. Premise 1. Every composite object has a cause. Premise 2. If every composite object has a cause, then an absolutely simple and non-composite first member exists. Therefore, an absolutely simple and non-composite first member exists. Premise 3. If there is an absolutely simple and non-composite first member, then God exists. Conclusion. Therefore, God exists. Premise 1 states that every composite object has a cause. So to start, what is meant by composite object? A composite object refers to any object that is composed of parts that form a whole. Examples are plentiful. Tables, chairs, and books surround us and are all composed of parts. But why think that such composite objects have a cause? Well, consider the fact that composite objects can't exist unless the parts are combined in the right way. A table can't exist unless the legs and surface are appropriately ordered. It's also apparent that a composite whole cannot itself be the cause of its own parts, since the parts are more fundamental than the whole. This would mean that an efficient cause is necessary to bring the parts of the composite object together. It's important to note here that this does not only happen at a single moment in time, but also in a more fundamental sense that their continued existence at any particular moment of time depends at that moment on other things which exist at that moment. For the parts of the table have to stay together even after they are first put together. And as we covered before, the parts of the table cannot do this, so the composite object needs a cause outside of itself. Putting all this together, we see that a composite exists at any moment insofar as its parts are combined at that moment. This composition of parts requires a concurrent cause in order to sustain the existence of the composite object, and hence any composite object has a cause of its existence at any moment at which it exists. One might wish to reject this premise by appealing to myrtological nihilism, the view that there are no composite objects. Rather, there exist only myrtological symbols that are rearranged in object-like manners. So tables, for example, would not actually exist on this view, only myrtological symbols arranged in table-wise manners. However, myrtological nihilism has trouble answering the question, when is it true that the myrtological symbols are arranged object-wise? Philosopher Jonathan Talbot argues in his paper Against Myrtological Nihilism that there is no good answer to this question, and I think he is quite right about that. Furthermore, one main motivation for being a myrtological nihilist is that it supposedly solves puzzles in myr myriology. However, philosopher Bradley Redler has recently argued that such puzzles provide no reason to be a nihilist, since nihilism faces parallel puzz puzzles that other views have no issue resolving. Links to both papers in the description. These facts seriously undermine the viability of nihilism, so it should pose no threat to premise 1. With all of this in mind, then, we can affirm premise 1 with confidence. Now what about premise 2? Premise 2 states that if every composite object has a cause, then an absolutely simple and non-composite first member exists. Why think this is true? Well, reflect on the fact that if a composite object is caused by another composite object, then that composite object would also need a cause because of premise 1. Composite object A would have to be caused by composite object B, which would be caused by composite object C, and so on. This causal series will either have to go on forever, or terminate in a first member that is non-composite, as to avoid having a cause. So can this causal series go on forever? No, it cannot. First notice how this creates a causal dependence relationship. Composite object A depends for its existence on B, and B depends for its existence on C. There is dependence of the latter members on the former ones, this is what Phaser calls a hierarchical causal series. 
Phaser offers the following analogy on pages 24 through 26 of his book to see why such a series must have a first member. Quote, Consider once again the coffee cup as it sits on your desk. It is, we may suppose, three feet above the air. Why? Because the desk is holding it up. Naturally. But what holds the desk up? The floor, of course. And the floor in turn is held up by the foundation of the house. Since the desk, the floor, and the foundation have no power on their own to hold the cup afloat, the series could not exist in the first place unless there were something that did have the power to hold these intermediaries and the cup through them without having to be held up itself. Or to put it another way, if they have only derivative power to hold things up, then there must be something from which they derive it, something which does not have to derive it from anything else in return, but just has it built in. The sort of first cause that a hierarchical series must have, then, is a cause that has the power to produce its effects in a non-derivative and non-instrumental way. In the case of the cup, where the desk holds it up only because it derives its power from the floor, and the floor from the foundation, none of these things could hold up anything at all unless there were something which holds them up without having to be held up itself. End quote. In order to meet these demands, therefore, the first member must be non-composite, that is, not composed of parts. Since if it did consist of parts, then the first member would need a cause, it would not truly have non-derivative causal power. So then, we can confidently affirm our second premise as well. If every composite object has a cause, then there is an absolutely simple and non-composite first member. From these two premises, it follows that there is an absolutely simple and non-composite first member. Premise 3 asserts that if such a member exists, then God exists. But why think that the first member is God? Phaser shows us that by performing conceptual analysis on what the first member would have to be like, we can identify several divine attributes. The first member must be absolutely simple since it isn't composed of parts. The first member would have to be immutable, since to change entails gaining or losing some feature, and if the members could gain or lose some feature, it would not be simple or non-composite. The first member must be outside the space-time continuum, since to be in time entails change. Such a member must also be eternal, for if it came into being, it would have had a cause, which entails it had parts that were combined at the time it was caused, and it has no parts. Likewise, the first member must be endless, since if it could pass away, then that would entail it has parts which could be broken down, and again it has no parts. It's also true that the first member cannot be physical, since physical things tend to either be composed of parts, or be temporal, and none of these can apply to the first member. And lastly, the first member must therefore be a mind, since the only things that engage in causal relations are physical things and mental things, and the first cause isn't physical, therefore the first cause must be mental. Taking all these attributes together, we have a being that is immutable, outside our space-time continuum, endless, eternal, and mindful, that can very reasonably be called God, and so it follows that God exists.